Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topic is comparative statics. I cover this in lesson 3.4 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. You can check the video description for more information about that. Now remember, in the last video, we looked at a game of penalty kicks between a striker and a goalie, where the striker was perfectly accurate to his right side, but not so accurate to his left side, he only hits the goal with probability X, assuming the goalie misses on the dive. Now, we found the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium for this game, but let's actually start going a little bit further than that. Rather than just solving for equilibria, let's actually analyze the equilibria of this game. This is what we're going to be doing with comparative statics. So the question in particular that I want to answer today is, as the striker's accuracy improves to his left side, does he aim to the left more or less frequently? So in other words, going back to the strategic form of the game, the question is asking, as we increase the value of x, where x is, again, the accuracy of the kicker to his left side, what does the kicker do in equilibrium? Does he kick to the left more frequently or less frequently? That's what this question is asking here. And the way we answer these types of questions is through a process known as comparative statics. So what is a comparative static? Well, a comparative static is how a game's equilibrium behaviors change as er, equilibrium behaviors and outcomes change as a function of the game's parameters. So another way of putting this is how do the outputs change as a function of inputs? Whenever we have a game, there's just a few inputs that we have for that game. We have the number of players, we have the strategies for each player, and we have the payoffs for each player. Those are the inputs of the game, and the process of finding equilibria give us the outputs of the game. That's the strategies that the players actually play in equilibrium, and the payoffs associated with those particular equilibrium outcomes. And so what we want to know is if we tweak a particular input to the game, how does the output of the game change? And the way we go about calculating these comparative statics is a four-step process. This is going to seem a little bit burdensome at first, but once we actually go through each step, you'll see that each step isn't particularly difficult. So as long as we're good about going through things one by one by one and being very careful with each step, we shouldn't have much of a problem actually calculating comparative statics. So the first thing that we do is we solve for a game's equilibria. Then we calculate whatever element of interest that we're concerned with, with the question that we want to answer. And then we take the derivative of that element of interest with respect to the given exogenous variable. And then the last thing we do is we check whether it is increasing or decreasing as a function of that variable. So you'll notice that step three actually requires a bit of calculus. I said at the very beginning of this series that we would have to do a little bit of calculus eventually. This is the video where that actually comes up. Uh, if you haven't taken any sort of calculus before, then this might be a little bit of a problem, but I'll give you a non-technical version of this at the very end so you can at least see what I'm talking about here. And if you've taken any sort of calculus, you should be fine, because we're really just concerned with doing basic derivatives, at least in this particular part of game theory. And so as long as you've taken either a quarter or a semester of game theory, or rather of calculus, and you know how to do very basic derivatives, then you should be fine here. So let's go ahead and start working through this process of comparative statics. So the first thing you have to do is solve for the game's equilibria. You'll notice that I conveniently did this in the last video. So we've already found the equilibria of this penalty kicks game. It's a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium where the kicker aims to the left with probability one over one plus X and to the right with complementary probability while the goalie dives to the left with probability X over one plus X and dives to the right with complementary probability. So that part is already done. We're good to go there. We can go ahead and already move past this and get to the second step here. So the second step is to calculate the element of interest. So let's refer back to the question and figure out what the element of interest is. So the question is, as the striker's accuracy improves to his left side, does he aim to the left more or less frequently? So the question is really asking here, what is going on with the kicker's aim to the left? Is he doing that more or less often? So what we need to be able to do here to answer this question is to solve for the probability that he aims to the left. And because we've already calculated the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, this is something that we've already done. The striker is kicking to the left with probability 1 over 1 plus x. So we're good to go here.
Now, this can be a little bit more complicated if we are, say, talking about the expected utility of the players for the game. If we were wondering what the striker's expected utility is as a function of X, then we'd have to go ahead and calculate that expected utility. So that would require another step. But here we don't have to do that because we're just interested in the, the changing of the kicker strategy. And that's part of the mixed strategy in Ash Equilibrium. So we don't have to calculate anything else here. We just have to identify that this is the element of interest. And that's what we're going to be toying around with in the next step. And the next step is to take the derivative of that element of interest with respect to the given exogenous variable. So the exogenous variable here is the kicker's accuracy, which is represented by that x. So we're going to take the derivative of the probability that the striker kicks to the left uh, with respect to x. So that's going to look like this. The probability the kicker kicks left is 1 over 1 plus x. And so if you take the derivative of that, then you end up with this. So this is the quotient rule. If it's been a while since you've seen some calculus before, but this is what the quotient rule is. So the derivative of a fraction like this is the derivative of the numerator times the derivative of the denominator minus the not, uh, numerator times the derivative of the denominator divided by the denominator squared. So that's what that is. And we can do some simplifying here, and we eventually get to negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. So that's the derivative here. It's negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. So that's the third step, and now we're down to the final step. All we have to do now is check whether the function is increasing or the derivative is increasing as uh, increasing or decreasing as a function of that variable. I'll eventually get it out there. All right. So going back to the last slide again, you'll notice here that the numerator is negative. It's a negative 1. And since x is greater than 0, the denominator is always positive. And so therefore, the derivative is always negative. No matter what value of x we put in there, because remember that x always has to be positive, then this, this uh, fraction here, this derivative, is negative. And that means the function is decreasing. It's always decreasing in x. And so that means that the striker aims to the left less frequently as x increases. So think about that for a moment. Let that settle in for a second here. You might be asking yourself, what on earth is going on here? That result should seem a little bit strange, because after all, the better the striker is at aiming left, the less frequently he actually aims that way. That's a little bit weird. It's counterintuitive, and that's fine. Just let that settle in there for a moment. Let's ask yourself why that's the case, though. Remember that the game is strategic. It's not just the kicker strategy that matters. It's also the goalie strategy that matters. If the goalie knows that the kicker is particularly weak to one side, then the goalie doesn't have very much incentive to dive that way very frequently. She's going to want to dive to the stronger side more often. And so in order to make sure that the goalie isn't abusing that and always diving to the, right, or to the, the stronger side of the kicker, what the kicker has to do is he essentially has to compensate for his weakness. So if the striker aimed right more frequently, that's a strong side, then the goalie could just counteract him by diving right. And so the striker therefore compensates for his weakness by aiming to his weak side, the left side, more often. But as that weakness diminishes, there's no need to compensate for the weakness as much as the strength of the kicker or the accuracy of the kicker improves to the left side. And so that's why he's going to start aiming to the left side less frequently the stronger he becomes at aiming to the left. And to see this, we can quickly look at a non-technical proof. So if you've never seen calculus before, the way you can verify that what I'm saying is true is just by plugging in a few numbers here. So remember that the probability of kicking left is 1 over 1 plus x. And if accuracy is perfect, then x equals 1. And so if we just substitute x equals to 1 here, we get 1 over 1 plus 1, or 1 half. So the striker will aim to the left side half of the time if the kicker's accuracy is perfect to the left. But now imagine that the kicker's accuracy is 1 half. It's 50% of the time that it'll hit the goal on the left side, 50% of the time that it'll just completely miss. Well, in that case, if we substitute x equal to 1 half, we get 1 over 1 plus 1 half. And that just simplifies to two thirds. So that means the striker is aiming to the left with probability two thirds, which means when this, the striker is weaker, he is actually aiming to the weak side more frequently, which is the weird counterintuitive result that we had talked about before. So I think that this is a really good example of why comparative statics is so really cool and useful because you can calculate comparative statics and find really neat and strange results like this. And so it's something that I always recommend that you do is that whenever you have a game 
and you have exogenous variables in it, you look to see if there are some interesting comparative statics by just taking the comparative statics of the exogenous variables and see if you can actually find something really neat and really interesting like this. And then you have something else to talk about when you solve the game. So that is the idea of comparative statics in the four-step plan. If this is a little bit unclear, there are a ton of examples in section 3.4 or lesson 3.4 of the textbook. And so this is just one of them. It's the first example in it, but you can go through the rest of the examples and I think you'll have a good sense of how to calculate these things because we'll be doing it time after time after time after time in the textbook. And you should have a good idea about how to do these things on your own by the time you get through all of this. So if comparative statics is still a little bit tricky to you, I suggest you go ahead and look there. This is actually going to wrap up our discussion of comparative statics in the video lectures. And in the next lecture, we'll start talking about what is actually necessary for a mixed strategy to be able to be played in equilibrium. And so this is something that we're going to be, or we have been dealing with all along, but it's something I want to actually address explicitly in the next video. So I hope you join me then. And until next time, take care. Bye now.